uh, if I go full screen, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, it works. And, and my sound is fine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the last time we did this, uh, somehow nightmarishly, uh, my sound started to break up and <laughs> it became oh, no. <laughs> like really a nightmare, a uh, really big mess, but I uh, hope that it's, it's not uh, something regular that happens with Zoom. Uh, I was blaming my computer, it's a tablet, because I want to use the pen. Yeah. Um, I might not use the pen at the end, but uh, because I was not sure that I can use a tablet, so I started to write all the slides and whatnot. So mm -hmm. um, we'll see. Um, I guess so maybe if, you, it's if you have a wired internet connection, that may help, I suppose, but usually Wi Fi works fine too. Yeah, my my internet is uh, pretty good usually. We can check how we're doing with the internet. Okay. Yeah, should be fine. So how's it going? Good, good. Thanks uh, for uh, giving the talk. Um, yeah, where is we'll be, yeah, we'll be starting in uh, two minutes. Um, so we usually, usually, sorry, I bypassed. Yeah. You guys are still uh, ordered to stay at home or is it possible to go out these days? Um, it is possible to go out with face cover. Um, that's the rule. Okay, so that's compulsory? It is compulsory, I think. I, I think, I mean, some people may not follow that, so. <laughs> but yes, I think it is compulsory. Oh, yeah. Like, why would you do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I guess, yeah, like the other day I went to the climbing place. Then it's a bit weird to wear a face mask while you're doing bouldering and whatnot. It's uh, all these bandits on the wall. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, like. Uh, I don't see people wearing face masks here uh, in Canada. I mean, this city is very sparsely populated. So usually right. you wave to the other person on the other side of the street and like meters away. And I guess if you go to downtown, then it's it's going to be busy air, but uh, okay. uh, suburbs are, I guess it's similar to the US suburbs are, you know, not many people spread out. Yeah. Are the case numbers going down in Alberta? Yeah, yeah. So they are reopening stuff uh, since last week. Uh, so the case numbers are very low. Um, so they said that uh, they're going to slowly reopen everything. I think the national parks are still not open, but uh, but you can go to the climbing place, for example, restaurants and whatnot. Yeah. There are special rules, though. Like it's, uh, you know, like plastic glass everywhere and special things. Okay, so I guess uh, we can get started. Um, great. Um, so yeah, so welcome everybody to today's special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today, we are delighted to have Professor Chaba Tsepersuari as our speaker. Uh, Chaba is a professor at the University of Alberta and also the lead of the foundations team at DeepMinds. He is best known as the co-inventor of the UCT algorithm, which is a method that introduces UCB-based exploration to Monte Carlo tree search, which ignited a lot of exciting advances such as AlphaGo. 
He is also known for his broad array of fundamental contributions to multi-arm bandits, reinforcement learning, and online learning, such as the first convergence results for SARSA and the introduction of vector value martingales in the analysis of linear bandits and discovery of a critical mistake in prior work. He has received the ECML slash PKTD Test of Time Award and has also been named a fellow of the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems and the Canada CIFAR AI Chair. Please welcome Chaba Sepersfar. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind of introduction and thanks for having me. Um, I don't know how it works. Uh, I guess if people have questions, then they're going to like raise their hands or write in the chat and then you're going to channel the questions to me or like, is that how it works? Yeah, so I mean, people can type their questions in the chat and then they can also um, use the raise hands feature in Zoom um, if they have a question and then um, I will direct the questions and then people can uh, just unmute okay. them. I just want to encourage everyone to please ask questions because uh, otherwise I will just feel that I'm talking to a computer screen. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so let's let's get started. Uh, so this talk is is uh, another iteration of these talks that that I keep doing uh, these days about model-based reinforcement learning uh, because. Um, I think model-based reinforcement learning has a lot of uh, potential, but uh, this potential is yet to be uh, bear some fruits. And so one needs to wonder, like, why, why is it that uh, we think firsthand that model-based reinforcement learning has good opportunities? And then why is it that these opportunities are not really met uh, that much? Uh, as far as uh, you can see in the empirical works. Anyways, um, so that's, um, that's the question, uh, and that uh, gives us the reason to talk about model-based reinforcement learning. Um, and um, so the premise of this talk is, is, is to give you an introduction of uh, what uh, this whole thing is about, uh, so what type of results are we expecting or can we expect to see? Uh, what type of results are we after? What are the existing results? And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I hope that uh, people will uh, go home and will think that they seen something interesting. Um, so first, uh, before I get to uh, the contents, I need to uh, thank my collaborators, really wonderful collaborators and uh, uh, I um, owe them uh, much. Uh, I've learned a lot from all of these people. Uh, basically, uh, the talk is going to be about two uh, topics. Uh, like after some introduction, I'm going to talk about one paper, which is, or two papers, which is the joint work of these uh, three gentlemen. And then um, we switch gears. Uh, hopefully time will uh, allow us to do that. And we talk about another very recent work, uh, which is uh, done with collaboration with these wonderful collaborators. Um, all right, uh, but uh, first to give you a context um, of uh, this work, uh, we need to talk a little bit about what is RL, what are the different RL tasks, what are the methods, models, state of the art, and what are the challenges. Uh, so uh, this is my graphical il illustration of uh, what uh, Markovian decision processes are. Markovian decision processes are going to be the model that uh, I'm going to use in this talk. Uh, and uh, I like them because of their mathematical elegance and uh, that comes from their simplicity. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a stochastic control process. Uh, so it's a controlled process because uh, there is some input uh, that a controller or agent, like depending on the community, uh, people call these uh, things different names, can provide. So in our community, we call these the actions. Uh, so, so these boxes represent the actions, and this is a sequential process, okay? And it's going to be stochastic, which is uh, illustrated by the presence of these dice. So what happens is that uh, there is a process uh, that I was, it's a, it's a, a controlled Markov process uh, through these states. Uh, 
So S0 is the first state at uh, time zero, S1 is the next state at time one, S2 is the next state at time two, and so on and so forth. And uh, jointly as a function of the state and an action uh, chosen by an agent, uh, a reward is generated, and, and this happens in every time step. So this results in a sequence of rewards. And uh, the controller is interested in maximizing the discounted sum of uh, all the rewards, okay? So the other thing that happens is that when the controller chooses an action and uh, we are at a given state, uh, the state and the action together determine a next state distribution over all possible states. So this, this state is going to be randomly chosen from a fixed distribution. Uh, so there's going to be different notations that I'm going to use, but uh, let me just switch to the pen. So, so one of the, so you could, you could write, for example, PSA and then S prime. Uh, so S um, is uh, an element of uh, the state space. So that's, uh, that's this calligraphic S. So that's one possible state. A is the element of the action set, that's a possible action. And then this is going to be just the probability of arriving at state S prime. I'm going to stick to the simplest possible case uh, when you just have finite Markov decision processes where both the state space and the action space are finite. I do this uh, for simplifying notation, avoid, uh, you know, like uh, measure theoretical considerations because they are not really central to what I want to say. So this simple model is, is, is sufficiently rich uh, in, in its structure that it leads to really interesting, challenging problems. So I'm just going to stick to this uh, very simple finite case. Um, so, um, so these are the transition probabilities and then you can connect them, uh, collect them uh, if you fix a given action that just gives you a Markov uh, transition kernel matrix. So, so you can represent all of this and that becomes your transition structure. Uh, but in this talk, uh, I often uh, going to, I'm just going to think about the transition structure as, you know, giving a matrix over zeros and ones of the state actions uh, to states. And I'm going to abuse notation. Uh, I hope that you can forgive me for that. Uh, because otherwise, it's, it's, it would be too complicated. You know, like if you have a finite state space, uh, then you can just think about the states being numbered without loss of charity. The same with the actions. Uh, so S uh, can be seen as, you know, just the integers. Uh, so this state space, uh, the first S integers, uh, these are the first A integers. And then S times A, it just represents, uh, you know, the first S times A integers in some order, okay? But if I want to address this matrix, I'm just going to write mer uh, mercilessly this pair of S and A, right? And that means like that some indexing needs to be better. It's an abuse of notation, but like, I hope that you are like, it's, it's clear, right? Um, okay, it's going to be very useful, I promise. Like this abuse is just like simplifies your life a lot. So, okay, so, the next thing is that uh, an agent chooses a policy which could generally be dependent on the history, but if you have access to the state, then you don't really need the, the history. What's the history, the past observations of the agent? So generally we assume that the agent can observe the state. So in this case, the agent could just use the, uh, the last state if he knows uh, the transition kernels, but if they don't know the transition kernel, or the rewards, uh, then uh, they might want to, to learn from the history. So their action is going to be in general history dependent. In any ways, whatever way uh, they want to uh, choose the action, it depends on uh, past observations. And that induces a probability distribution over, uh, you know, possible reward sec sequences and possi possible histories, uh, state action reward sequences. And, um, you can take the expectation, the expected value of all the future uh, discounted reward, and that gives you a value 
uh, depending on where you start, right? So uh, if you start at some state, then you get some value. If you start at some other state, then you get another value. So here gamma is this discount factor, which we introduced for convenience in the second part of the talk. I'm gonna drop it. There is a whole lot of discussion about why do we do this? Just, it's simple. Uh, it uh, brings in some uh, nice mathematical properties. Uh, yeah, the problems ch uh, remain challenging enough, so just bear with me. All right, so any questions for this? We're going to have another slide about notations, so maybe that uh, if, if there is any confusion, then uh, that slide will be uh, a good opportunity to ask uh, other questions. All right. Um, so other problems. Um, so there are various um, other problems, and the most standard one is that there is uh, maybe an unknown MDP. So that's uh, the environment. So there is an MDP sitting here. Uh, the agent doesn't know this, uh, but it can interact with the environment. So it sends actions to it, and then it sends this, the, the states and the rewards along the transitions that, that happen. And the agent's purpose is to maximize the total uh, reward. There is no discounting here. So that, that's why you might ask, like, how come we had the discounting on the previous slide? Well, in the online area case, I think uh, using discounted would be misguided. So let's, let's not think about that. But in there are maybe some other cases where discounting does make sense. Um, so another setting uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, planning with a simulator. So in this case, uh, this is a bit different. This is a computational problem. You have a simulator and uh, you just want to extract a good policy from the simulator. You don't care about how much reward you're collecting. You care about the query complexity in this case, like how, how many times do you have to interact with the simulator to uh, arrive at some good decision? And then if you continue doing that, like uh, visiting a new state, again, like how much computation is going to be needed, right? So that's uh, the second setting. Uh, and the third setting is when someone has collected uh, some experience uh, uh, and, and that experience is, is just stored on disk, let's say, and, and you want to use that to uh, uh, come up with a good policy. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about this. Uh, I just wanted to put this slide on so that like, people are studying these different settings. So today I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, but there are interesting uh, connections between uh, these. Uh, so online reinforcement learning can use batch reinforcement learning, obviously. So if you collected a lot of data, then why not use that to research a good policy? Uh, online reinforcement learning, of course, can use planning with a simulator. If the online algorithm decides to build a model of the environment, then uh, you can think about that model as, uh, as a simulator and then you can uh, try to extract information from that. Very often the case that this is how things are done actually. And batch reinforcement learning can use planning with a simulator as well. Uh, so it, we see that planning as sim with a simulator comes up a lot of times, uh, when, especially when you're talking about uh, uh, computation in the presence of models. Uh, and so planning with a simulator uh, is, is by and large just reinforcement learning as, as an optimization problem. So it has this interesting structure. And uh, when people um, use planning with a simulator uh, with a computer, very often the, the, the question is phrased as like, can we beat humans at some game or can we uh, beat some other heuristic algorithm uh, at uh, some planning problem, right? So you're, uh, you're benchmarking against uh, either humans or other algorithms, uh, and you just want to get good performance uh, with minimum computation, all right? Um, so with that, uh, I have to say that uh, these days, uh, it's really exciting to work in reinforcement learning because lots of people are interested and, and this is, uh, probably to a larger extent to a lot of successes, uh, to, uh, to these successes and some other successes that are not on the slide. Uh, 
that come from combining reinforcement learning with neural networks. Of course, people realized very early on in the 90s, or like even in the dawn of uh, reinforcement learning, that neural networks can be very powerful together with uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, yet, uh, so in today's talk, what I'm going to talk about mostly is like, how much do we understand uh, how to do computation uh, um, in the presence of um, approximate uh, representations like uh, approximation techniques like using neural networks. Uh, although I'm not going to go the neural network way, so caveat for today. Um, so we have a question from Sanjeev. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't understand how you combine online uh, RL uh, with simulators because the whole point of online is that you make no assumptions about the future, no? Uh, so, okay, so maybe this figure actually explains it. Uh, so even when you're building an online uh, so building, right? Right. So people um, do, um, you know, build these agents or whatnot, like it's an engineering uh, aspect of our work. Um, so they, uh, they have they're building these agents that have various components so they they would uh you know like create an agent that has a model uh inside of it um and they are refining the model based on the experience uh in this closed loop uh, uh like when this closed loop collects more and more experience the model is refined and the model is used to extract a policy that tells the agent how to act so I, I guess what confused me just was this online, I think of online OCO, et cetera, as making no assumption about the future. That's not the way you meant online? No. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. okay, so like, okay, so there is uh, the part of the literature online learning uh, where uh, you are trying to work with uh, any sequences, no assumptions about the environment, whatnot. Right. So here online is meant in a different way. Uh, it's meant that uh, you're collecting in a continuous interaction uh, information about the environment and you're trying to maximize your reward. Okay, good. Okay, That's so almost online at different time. Almost no connection to online learning. I mean like online learning results are used to design these algorithms, but uh, it's it's different setting. Okay, I got confused about this. So we have another question from Kisham Hananganti. Um, so the question is, can you expand on batch RL using planning with a simulator? Can I expand on that? Uh, well, I said that I'm not going to talk about batch RL, but... Uh, I just wanted to know if uh, batch RL is just using offline data, right? Uh, are yeah. you that's the definition. Batch RL is using offline data. There is no more interaction with the, the system. Okay. And you want to come up with a good policy. And of course, you can build a model and then you can try to extract a good policy from a model. Yeah. But uh, can it also interact with the simulator? Uh, I mean, that's what. No, no, no. Uh, so in Batch RL, there is no simulator to start with. Okay, yeah. You only have data. But if you decide to build a model, uh -huh. You can build it in the form of a simulator. Oh, okay. Good. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Anything else? Uh, no, I think those are all the questions. Right. Uh, so, uh, so back to uh, this uh, this slide. Um, so uh, these RAL algorithms generally have these uh, four components in them. Uh, not going to talk about the state estimation thing. It's it just like if you are not don't have the luxury to observe the states, then you have to work much harder. This is a really interesting topic on its own. For the sake of generality, I put it there, but uh, let's just today assume that that box is empty and you observe the state. Still, uh, there are other boxes to fill. Uh, the policy box, uh, it tells the agent how to act. Sometimes that's just a computational part, by the way, like it interacts with the model. And uh, do you see my cursor? I can switch to the laser pointer. Uh, so, so the policy can interact with the model and it try to extract information from the model. And then, of course, as uh, more uh, experience comes in, you can refine the model 
But you can decide not to build a model, but just build value functions. Uh, we're gonna talk later about like what these value functions are. And somehow they can inform the policy. And so, okay, so these are the components that reinforcement learning people uh, we will tend to talk about, and I just wanted to put this slide on so that we are familiar with the names of these components. Uh, later on, hopefully everything is going to be a little bit more clear. All right, so with that, um, so here is an example. Okay, this, this is pretty horrible. We don't need to understand it. Uh, I mean, it's horrible in the way that it looks very complicated, lots of boxes. But this is just like one uh, illustration of, of a recent paper where people try to uh, build a model and use a model inside an RR agent uh, to uh, come up with, with good decisions and the whole thing works end to end, which means that from observations to observations. So here these guys don't have the luxury to observe the state, so they are stacking last what frames of this game and that kind of like has enough information so that you don't have to worry about uh, distant past. Um, okay, um, so why use models? Uh, so because I'm going to advocate today for, for the use of models, but uh, mostly I'm just going to talk about uh, the challenges that come with uh, using the models, but what are the benefits of using the, the models? Uh, so I think that the main benefit is that uh, if you have the right sort of bias that you can build into your model, so you know, like you can compress a lot of information into your model, and then you can generalize uh, to new situations uh, with the help of this bias in ways you can't do otherwise, okay? So it's, um, it's something that, um, that you can do. Uh, so an example of this would be, if you have a robotic system, maybe it has a very complex sense of information, uh, but uh, inside, uh, maybe uh, there is a reduced model that you can represent uh, the essential information about actually the like internal state of the robot at least. Uh, even though it looks very complicated, uh, you can simplify it um, and if you know its structure, uh, you know physics, uh, then you can rule out a lot of different possibilities and this bias can help you to learn much faster. Okay, so we know this story. If we have prior information, we could use that prior information. So models are like this. Uh, But here is a reality check. So how often do we see models being used uh, in these uh, very appealing um, state-of-the-art results? Well, <laughs> uh, if you wish, uh, there is only one example here, but there as well, it's, it's more like a simulator is being used. So it's not that uh, people very often would decide to build agents that uh, estimate models. So the next question is why? So if models are so great, why people uh, don't find it at least easy to, to use them uh, in current results? So I identify, I identify three challenges. Uh, so the first challenge is that inference or planning can be really hard. So even if you have a model, uh, branching factors could be really large. So, uh, these poor animals uh, have so many different masses that they can move and they have to uh, make decisions every, I don't know, like tens of a second uh, or even less if they don't want to die. And so just imagine the branching factor of that. Add to that the stochasticity of the environment. Uh, I mean, like, how can you plan for whether you're going to uh, sleep or not uh, when you're standing on, on these rocks? Uh, it's really hard. Uh, so the planning problem itself can be really, really, really hard. Um, there could be also a really long uh, time scale. So maybe this is just showing the end of a long pass, somehow they got there, and then this is where they are actually stuck. Uh, that's a modeling mistake. Uh, if they had a better model of the environment, maybe they would have never gotten here. Um, Okay, so, so that's ch challenge number one. Challenge number two is that, of course, if you have a model, um, 
and the model is not the same as reality as it would never be, uh, and uh, you're planning forward in the future, then uh, the modeling errors can compound. And as a result, you know, like you can arrive at erroneous decisions. So in this example, for example, it's, it's really hard to properly model contact forces, surfaces, uh, all of that. Um, and because of that, it's really hard just to write an algorithm, like a, a good planning algorithm and a, with a good simulator that you can just transfer to a real robot and it's going to work out of box. So this is called a sim to real problem. Uh, so even if you have a model, uh, just planning for that model may not be sufficient. Uh, so you have to somehow deal with that. And, and the third challenge is that uh, it's not so trivial to decide unless you have really strong prior information. It's not so trivial to decide what to model. And, and if you try to be test agnostic or self-supervised, which is a very popular approach these days uh, to think about how to build models for reinforcement learning. So what does that mean? Like, uh, remember the previous slide, we were trying to model uh, observations based on observations, based on past observations and actions, like what the future observations are going to be. Well, Observations are complicated things. Even um, in an example like this, there is this Atari game, uh, Beam Rider. Um, the observation is very simple, uh, but it has many, many elements. And, and you might not know, but in this game, I don't know why this is not playing, this is a movie. But anyways, uh, so these beams are supposed to come uh, towards you. So the whole background is kind of moving and then there are these bullets that are also coming at you and there are other ships and they're moving. And so there are so many things going on and you, uh, if you, if you um, just want to model observations and you have a simple loss function that tells you that, well, okay, you should minimize discrepancy between observations and, and predictions, then maybe you're gonna focus a lot on modeling the beams, but you miss the bullets. And indeed, that is the story that I keep hearing from my colleagues. So modeling uh, in a task agnostic fashion, that you don't care about uh, what part of the observations are important and what part are maybe not important is not so simple. Um, so, but then the question is like, how, do you, how can you decide what's important, what's not important? before solving the task. So that's, that's the third challenge. Okay. So we have a question from uh, Rohit Goswami. Um, the question is, is it fair to say that in this context, the term model essentially means a prior over possible values? Read it again. Uh, is it fair to say that? Uh, is it fair to say that the term model is essentially uh, referring to uh, a prior over the possible values? Well, the model could mean many different things. Uh, if in the context of a finite um, state action MDP, it could just mean that you're trying to estimate the transition probabilities. Uh, so it could be much simpler than that. It could be more complicated than that. It can mean many things. Right, thank you. Um, and I believe some more his question is answered, but if not, feel free to unmute. Okay, great. Yes, uh, it essentially answered. Uh, so, I mean, at a high level, can we view model as a, essentially an assumption about the transition probabilities, like uh, an assumption about the family of transition probabilities that we are willing to consider? Uh, a specific model instance would be uh, just a, a transition model. Let's, uh, uh, for the sake of simplicity, think that the rewards are given to us. Uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, modeling the rewards. Um, and uh, a modeled family would be something that you just said, right? Uh, in the second part of my talk, I'm going to take this very general viewpoint that uh, 
a modeling assumption means nothing but uh, a restriction on the possible set of uh, transition models that you're willing to consider when you're modeling the environment. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, um, so let's uh, go to part one, uh, which is about efficient planning. Um, so if you have a model actually in the form of a simulator, uh, how can you use it? Uh, this is an optimization problem. So this slide shows what we want. There is a model. There should be a planning process that exerts a policy. Uh, and uh, the policy should be uh, one that maximizes value. So, uh, so let's, let's, let's jump into defining things. So this is, uh, this is a point where I, I will try to write something. Hopefully uh, I will be able to, to write things. Um, okay. So, um, so we, are, we have an MVP and we assume it's finite for the sake of simplicity. Uh, so the state space is S, action space is A. The transition matrix is this S A by S matrix uh, and the reward is just an uh, S A dimensional uh, big vector. Um, so a policy uh, for, the con for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to simplify it uh, to just a map from the state space uh, to distributions over actions, okay? And, and when we refer to uh, elements of this, then, uh, well, with one notation, you could just say that for every, every state S, uh, that is uh, pi of S, and then you can ask for the A's component of that. Uh, so that gives you the probability of choosing action A in state S. All right. Uh, so the next thing that uh, I'd like to define is this uh, pi of, uh, P of pi matrix. So this is going to be a, um, a probability matrix uh, that is S by S. How does it work? Uh, this is going to uh, give you a Markov kernel that underlies uh, choosing action uh, from this policy pi whenever you arrive at the state. So uh, what does it mean? So it means that uh, the probability of transitioning from S to S prime is going to be equal to uh, the sum over the actions of taking that action um, in the state S and then uh, using the transition kernel to transition to the state S prime. So the next object that we need uh, to formally define uh, things is, is the value function of a policy. So this is going to be uh, just simply the sum of um, all future rewards so remember if, uh, so you, ha you have this uh, P of pi, this is a Markov transition kernel. If I take its T spar, that means that like, where am I going to be in T steps? So uh, P of pi to the power of T, S and S prime is the probability of arriving at S prime from state S if you followed policy pi for t time steps, okay? So that's just like, you know, standard thing. And so uh, what this value function does is that it gives you uh, um, the expected reward. And so, uh, so the other thing that to note is that if you take, uh, sorry, I, I, should, I should write R of pi. So if, if you take, uh, so what is R of pi? So R of pi, is a similar thing to pi of pi. So it's just uh, the expected reward um, under policy pi, expected immediate reward under policy pi. Um, 
So this is out of pi at s. Okay, so at a given state, what is the expected reward that I'm going to receive? And uh, so P of pi applied to R of pi. If you write out what this means, um, this is just nothing but uh, at a given state S, it is uh, P of pi S S prime R of pi S prime so uh, summed over S prime. So this is just the expected reward after one step of transition, right? If you start with state S. Similarly, if you take the T bar, because we talked about that uh, P of pi to the power of T, just a T step transition probabilities under policy pi, uh, you can put that T there. So this is just the expected reward after t, t steps of the transition. And so what you see here is the, the total expected reward given all possible states. So if you, you take a given state S, then you can just like put, put, those, put those there. And so uh, this term gives you uh, the expected reward at state S, uh, if you start at uh, state S after T transitions and uh, you're discounting them, and you take their sum. So this is the long-term expected total uh, discounted reward under a policy pi. So this just means you're following pi in all time steps, uh, you take all the discounted rewards. Uh, it should all make sense, hopefully. Does it make sense? I guess it does. All right. Uh, so the next thing is, uh, what is our goal? So our goal in general is to come up with an optimal policy. What is an optimal policy? An optimal policy is one whose uh, value function by uh, V of pi star is pointwise dominating the value function of all the policies. You take any other policy and uh, you're dominating that policy from uh, all initial states. You're collecting more reward than any other policy from any state. And the question is, does there exist such a uh, policy at all? It turns out that because of the market property, it's not very hard to see that uh, these policies do exist. Um, and V star, is going to denote the value function uh, under uh, an optimal policy. Now Q star, sorry for the heavy notation, it's it just uh, it's a little bit, um, I mean, you can't really avoid this. So Q star is, uh, if you take um, a state and an action, then you get an immediate reward there if you follow that action. And after that, you arrive at some future um, state S prime with some probability. And in that state, you follow the optimal policy. So you are asking the question, what is the reward that I'm going to get the total expected discounted reward if my first action is free and all the others are optimal. Okay, so that's, that, that is given by Q star. So Q star is going to be uh, an element of R to the S A. So Q of pi is, is very similar. It is just uh, R plus gamma P uh, of uh, V of pi. So this says that first action is free and uh, for the remaining time steps, we are following policy pi. And uh, there is the major result of uh, MDPs, which says that once you know Q star, you know optimal policies. In particular, if uh, by abusing the notation, uh, if you choose in state S the action 
uh, that ma maximizes Q star at that state, then that gives you an optimal policy. So it's sufficient to calculate Q star, which reduces to V star calculation. All right, so this is cleaned up on the next slide. Uh, this is just repeating the same thing, just uh, not with my uh, borderline readable uh, handwriting. Um, all right, so any questions for this? Uh, so this should clear up, like what is the computational problem? The computational problem is that you're given an MDP and you just want to compute an optimal policy or if you're given an MDP in a state, you just want to compute an optimal action uh, or a distribution over the actions that is, if you continue doing this at all states, uh, it results in an optimal policy. Any questions? If anybody has any questions, um, you can free, free, uh, feel free to either type in the chat box or raise your hand. Okay. I'm going to assume that uh, this is all clear. Okay. Uh, actually, I had a quick uh, question, uh, Shaba. Uh, just about uh, the uh, notion of a policy. So a policy is always just uh, a function from, uh, from states to action. Uh, it seems like in your notation, but the question I have is more, if it's, a, it's, if it's for instance, a game, uh, at, any, at any time uh, during the game, I'm also thinking about the past. So, are we if you don't do the MDP, policy? you would be thinking about the past. So in general, policies, uh, and when people build up the theory for MDPs, then policies can depend on the past. And then they prove that there is no advantage. If you know the MDP, then there is no advantage of using past information. Okay, so the optimal policy doesn't care about the past. That's yeah, exactly you can question. prove that this restricted class of policies that I'm talking about contains an policy that is optimal, even if you didn't, like amongst all policies that can also use the pass. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So it's sufficient to just consider this class uh, when you're defining the optimization problem and you're not losing it. So, um, so we act have another question from Kishan Panaganti. Uh, so I think what the question is basically asking, is the optimal policy always a deterministic policy? In an MDP, you can always choose a uh, deterministic policy to be optimal, but uh, if you have multiple maximizers here, then you can uh, choose any distribution over the maximizers that also gives you optimal policy. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's uh, move on. Um, all right, so um, in the MDP literature and, and reinforcement learning, people keep talking about the curse of dimensions. So what is that? Uh, so this refers to Bauman's uh, observation that uh, in all the MDPs that we tend to care about, the state space is huge it has a combinatorial form. And so if you have D variables, then even if, uh, you know, like uh, so one, two, and, and D, the, these are the, the possible uh, components of the state, the, the state would be described generally as tapas, D tapas. That D is always big and uh, the number of different values in our components can also be big. Uh, generally, uh, th this is going to be exponential in, in D, right? So uh, you, even if I only have two levels, you know, components, I get two to the D. I'm thinking about solving problems with a large D. Um, this is an exponential growth. Uh, methods that will try to enumerate all possible states are doomed. Similarly for actions, uh, you can translate large number of actions to large number of states. Uh, that's possible. Uh, so at the end of the day, I'm going to focus on the case when the number of states is huge and the number of actions is not huge. 
So in general, that's that's what the curse of dimension refers to. And so the corollary to this is that you can't afford polynomial computation in the size of the state action uh, space. And uh, then we're looking for methods that avoid uh, even linear. So you need sublinear or like computation that is independent of the size of the state space. Uh, and uh, of course, there is this result by Christos Papadimitriou and John Tsitsikis that says that computing P star, uh, the optimal policy is, is P complete. So if you really want to compute the optimal policy, then uh, you are kind of doomed. So you have to give up on the goal of uh, computing the optimal policy. So you have to use approximations. It's not surprising. Um, so then how can we plan uh, if you have large models? So how, like, how, like planning refers to finding uh, good actions or actions that the optimal policy would take uh, or a near optimal policy would take. Uh, so people worked a lot on uh, search algorithms and, and search algorithms are great uh, because uh, you can actually plan in a discounted MVP uh, with a complexity that is independent of the size of the state space y, because uh, if you want an epsilon accuracy, then it's enough to plan uh, with a branching factor of one over epsilon to some power, I don't remember, maybe two, and up to a depth of uh, one over one minus gamma. Okay. So the reason, because uh, the reason of that is because after some depths, after eight steps, the rewards are discounted to gamma to the power of h, and so when this becomes smaller than your epsilon that you're shooting for, then you're done. Like you don't care about any future rewards, and then the only thing that you have to fight is that uh, in a stochastic MDP there could be many many next states but you can use random subsampling. So this is the sparse sampling idea. Um, and uh, so this is great. Uh, you can plan uh, in a time that's independent of the size of the uh, state space, but the problem is uh, that this is still too large. So this is exponential in the planning horizon. So this planning horizon is, is going to be generally one over one minus gamma and we can think about gamma being very, very close to uh, one. So it's, it's not, not a good thing. It doesn't quite work on its own. So you have to add something to it. And then what people were trying to do is to, to mix in value function approximation. And that's, that's going to be uh, the first part uh, I'm going to talk about. And then there are hybrids uh, that people mix um, look at trees uh, with value function approximation. There are also ideas about restricting the model class. Uh, if your model class allows efficient planning, why not? Uh, QRs would be one example, but you have infinitely many states and actions, but no one cares because it's so structured. Um, all right, so what is this value function approximation idea? So the idea is that uh, uh, the value function uh, lies close to the span of, uh, of some features. Uh, just wondering about whether I've lost some slides here. Okay, uh, yes, I, I see that I, I did. Uh, so, so what is the idea? So the idea is that you want to compute uh, with a hint and the hint comes in the form of features and someone, or with a promise, and someone promises you that, hey, look, the optimal action value function is going to be very close to the span of these features, okay? And you're gonna have access to a simulator that can generate next states uh, from the model. So there is a black box that, uh, that does this for you. And, um, and also uh, you can access the rewards. Uh, so there is no uncertainty about the rewards and you can access the features. I'm wondering about like what happened last time. They're gone. Okay. 
Um, another question is, uh, under these assumptions, the, there is this promise, right? So notice that, uh, so there is this epsilon. So what is this epsilon? So it means that uh, maybe, so like to quantify it, uh, so Q star can be uh, well approximated in uh, L infinity max norm. Uh, with D parameters, so that, that's your epsilon, okay? And the problem is that, that this epsilon is going to be so small, maybe even zero, that uh, it makes sense to try to, to use the features. Uh, there is a bound that says that if you only know uh, the optimal action value function up to an, some other epsilon adder, then the errors in your policy, if you try to use that, just, you know, like uh, usual greedy way. So the greedy way is that you have some Q, which is not, not Q star, and, and you just try to extract a policy by saying that, oh, if I'm at state S, then I just want to follow uh, like the maximizing action in, in every state. So if you do this in every state and you had an, uh, an epsilon error here, epsilon prime error, then the error of this policy in terms of the value can blow up to, by a factor of one over one minus gamma, okay? And we know that that's tight, so you can't really improve that. So if you focus on this value function computation, then the first thing that you need to swallow is that this epsilon better be really small compared to this one over one minus gamma or, or it's not going to fly. But let's, let's assume that that's the case. So it, it still makes sense to, uh, to talk about this. In particle, uh, maybe someone makes a promise that there is an exact representation. You just don't know these parameters, D, D parameters. So, and D can be much smaller, you know, than, than the number of states. So that's, that's the promise. And, and the question is, uh, can you do something? So this was initiated in the 70s um, by uh, uh, Belmon, actually, uh, with uh, polynomial basis functions. And then uh, there is a, a nice paper that uh, uh, was written by Paul Schweitzer and Seidman in 1986, uh, I believe. Uh, which kind of uh, flashes out these ideas uh, a little bit more generally than what uh, Bamon was talking about. Bamon was just talking about polynomial approximation. These guys were, oh, uh, we can do this more generally. All right. Um, is there any questions for this? There aren't any questions. You can uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I guess that's. All right, okay. Uh, so one idea would be to use uh, successive approximations. Um, so uh, this is this idea where, um, so it turns out that the optimal uh, action value function is the fixed point of an operator. It's called the Bamon operator. I'm not going to write it here. Uh, and uh, so you might hope that, um, you know, you can just plug, plug in things here um, um, and, and, and hope that this is going to work uh, and try to solve this. And one way uh, of trying to solve a non, so this T operator is a, is a contraction. So one way of, of finding a fixed point is it just to iterate, like the charts on iteration, like the simplest idea of all. And then uh, since T is a contraction, this, this is going to uh, converge to, to Q star. And so, the, uh, so this looks difficult to solve directly because T is a nonlinear operator. So the idea would be to, to use iteration. But, but when you're using the iteration, then there is the span of phi. So that's, that's this linear up, uh, space. And, and you are somewhere here and the span of phi, so here is a phi of theta of k. The t operator pushes you out of this subspace and then you would project back. Okay, so that's your projection. 
and then you try to construct the next uh, parameter vector this way. So it's like solving a regression problem or, or something like that. Uh, and so you try to solve the, for the fixed point of this. So this is your new iteration procedure. Um, so this seems like a very good idea, um, may work. Uh, a lot of the reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, Q learning, variations of it, double Q learning, whatnot, you name it, fitted Q iteration are based on this idea. Fortunately, this is a doomed idea. So even in the case, uh, when you know that this equation has a solution, with no errors. So the solution to this is Q star. There are examples where this just explodes. It's easy to construct examples like that. So today I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, it's quite interesting to know that uh, a lot of the research in reinforcement learning is, is still going this way. Uh, it's a little bit puzzling, um, but uh, it's not like that this is always doomed. Just like in general, even in some favorable conditions, it doesn't work. Uh, so you have to do like, I don't know, like make extra assumptions. Um, and so the question is, okay, so if we just stick to the original problem, we only know that Q study is well approximated uh, with the span of the features, what can we do? Maybe that, this is not uh, what we should be doing. So another idea is not the fixed point idea, it's, it's uh, rewriting the fixed point equation as a linear program. Turns out that you can formulate a linear program, it's written here, Okay, so V is the, the variable in the linear program. It's V because it's like the value function at the end of the day. And C is a, an all positive coefficient. It's S dimensional as, as is this very big number. And um, so uh, R of A is just like, uh, you know, like R of uh, S A. So the immediate reward R of A S uh, is just that. Uh, so it's just a vector of immediate rewards under action A, P of A is the uh, transition curl under action A. And so you can write this linear program. Uh, so how many constraints does it have? It has S times A constraints because uh, this V is S dimensional. Okay, so altogether we are facing a linear program with S times A constraints, S variables. But if you solve this linear program, what you get out of it is V star, which is good because once you have V star, you just do this one step look at calculation uh, that I was uh, telling you that gives you Q star and you're done. Okay. Uh, so um, with this other notation, we can, uh, we can write this, uh, this linear inequalities, reordering stuff and, and introducing some uh, matrix notation. Uh, so this E matrix uh, just copies V uh, A times, uh, so stacking all these constraints. Uh, and this is just a transition kernel, which is uh, an S by S A by S S kernel. Uh, so uh, these uh, constraints can be written in this form and, and very functions satisfying this constraint are called the superharmonic function. Oh, so just to clarify, um, is there still function approximation here? There is no function approximation. Wait for the next slide. Okay. Uh, so, so the next slide. Just, just to make sure, this is all just classic, right, so far? This is classic. This is had 70s, right? Uh, so this is 70s. Uh, I just don't know what people know about these things, so I'm uh, sorry for going so slow. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to some need soon. Um, so approximate linear programming. Uh, so this was still introduced in the same paper by Schweitzer and Seidman in the 86. Uh, so they just said, okay, like we have too many variables, uh, guys. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can introduce these features and we want the D variables only. So we're gonna add a constraint. So add this constraint, all right? 
So you might wonder about, okay, is this going to be still feasible or, or the feasibility set suddenly becomes empty? It turns out that there is a very mild condition that the all one vector is in the span of the features like this for some, some parameter, d dimension and parameter vector. Like uh, you add the all one component to, to your features and then you can shift around things. And then here on this side, if you shift around, the rate of change is one. Here, the rate of change is gamma because this is a stochastic matrix. It's all fine. Like you can always uh, keep your LP feasible. This is a big trick. Uh, so, and this is going to be very useful. And in the future, we're going to make this, keep making this assumption that uh, was, one is in the span of the features. No, at least you have an LP, you have only D variables, you have too many constraints. What do you do? Well, it's a boom. <laughs> like constraint generation, uh, randomization, like all different ways. Uh, people are trying to reduce the number of constraints. Uh, lots of ideas floating around. Uh, not so many theoretical results. Um, so uh, there are some theoretical results about if you use uh, constraint sampling, uh, um, but uh, I'm not going to talk about those uh, today. The problem is that uh, they come with some caveats. The constraint sampling distribution, uh, if uh, you try to choose it in an agnostic, uninformed fashion, it doesn't work. It doesn't quite work. You get some divergence terms which are not very nice. Um, okay, so um, so this was state of the art uh, around uh, 2018, uh, where uh, uh, Chandra Shekhar Lakshminar and Shalab Mantagar, actually Chandru, uh, like the, this, this first guy, uh, was like, okay, we, we must do better than this. Uh, so why don't we swallow uh, things and just say that well, we need to reduce the constraints in some way. We don't know how we are going to reduce the constraints. Let's study in general how to reduce the constraints. So they set out to understand what happens to the uh, approximation error. If you are, you know, like summing the constraints over the, all, all the actions, and then you introduce this non-negative value the weighting matrices. So altogether, you, will, you end up with M constraints here where the thinking is that M is, is a small number. It's like as small as D, okay? And then you just want to understand uh, what happens if I do this. Um, and the first uh, thing is that maybe you're gonna erase too many constraints, right? Like uh, this can become unbounded very easily. We are trying to minimize this objective. Maybe the, there is no solution to this. It's an unbounded linear program. So how do we prevent that? So one way of preventing that is to introduce uh, what we call the corset. So a corset is going to be a subset of the states such that the feature vectors at other states can be written as the positive uh, linear combinations uh, of the feature vectors at those other states. So this is kind of the picture that you should have in mind. This is like a conical approximation. It turns out that this is actually a convex uh, city constraint uh, because you have the, the constraint that one is lies in the span of the features. Uh, so because of that, um, it also happens that these coefficients, if they exist, they're gonna sum to one. So um, in the future, we're going to make the assumption that there exists this small set, core set, such that the feature vectors at other states can be written as positive linear combination or convex combinations of the feature vectors at the selected few states. And uh, I will be content with a, uh, an ergotum uh, whose query complexity is going to be polynomial in D, uh, the number of core states, the number of actions, and maybe one over one minus gamma and the desired accuracy, okay? Uh, one over like the inverse accuracy. Um, okay. Any questions for this? So at least this core set, so the idea is that if you have this core set, 
uh, this is going to stop you from creating an, in, an unbounded problem. Okay. Because uh, if you go back, you can see that on both sides, you see uh, just everything is, is projected through the feature. So if you uh, can express all the other features as the conic combination of all these features, this is still bounded. Okay, um, so we do have a question from uh, Teng Dong. Uh, the question is, how can we choose the core sets? Um, so I'm not going to, so it's, it's the same thing as like, I, I just ask the designer to design features such that the core set is small and give me the core set. So I'm not going to, uh, um, say anything clever about how in genera you should, I mean, like you want to choose the core set, like given some features such that it has a small cardinality, that's it. Uh, because the number of constraints is going to be equal to the number of uh, states in this core set. But uh, in general, uh, so, so right now we are sh kind of introducing uh, an additional burden on the person choosing the features, but at least this is agnostic to the MVP, right? Like I don't care about what the MVP is going to be at the end. If you still have the promise that you can approximate well the optimal action value function, and you should also tell me what this core set is, or tell me one core set which doesn't have too many states in it, uh, then I want to uh, get this polynomial complexity design, right? All right, um, so uh, the first result, um, which is uh, a modern result, uh, says that uh, if um, you have uh, this core set uh, and uh, you solve uh, theta hat, uh, the LP that resides from, you know, summing all these constraints, uh, so this WA matrix in this case becomes the matrix that selects the core set states, okay? So just consider those matrices. So for all the actions is the same. You're just selecting, it's, it's a binary matrix. It just selects states, okay? Um, so M is going to be the number of uh, core sets. So this WA is going to be, you know, this binary matrix that is uh, M by S. And it's just like going and choosing uh, the components of uh, uh, that correspond to core states. Okay. Um, so if you take this LP, it has a small number of constraints and it has uh, a small number of variables, D, B and M, small. You can hope to solve it. Well, there's a slight problem because PA is a big object. The number of next states in it is still big. So we, you'll need to get back there uh, and talk about that. But imagine that that's not a problem. You just read out the solution to this LP somehow. Uh, if you were able to do that, uh, then uh, you can approximate the optimal value function up to an epsilon over one minus gamma accuracy. So you blow up your uh, accuracy uh, by a factor of one over one minus gamma. It's kind of not unexpected because uh, you need to solve this planning problem. And epsilon is this um, max norm matter. And, um, and, and you, you have a guarantee that you are uniform, not uniformly fast, sorry. It's like in L1 norm, you are well approximating uh, the optimal value function. So you might, so the next question is going to be, how can we use this result, right? So here, this result, by the way, is true even if uh, C is non-negative value. It doesn't have to be strictly positive anymore which is non-negative value, but uh, the coefficient sum to one. Uh, so this was uh, joint work with uh, uh, 
Chandri and Shab, and uh, Roshan, uh, my student, uh, improved uh, the bond that we had initially uh, very recently. Uh, so that's, that's this result. I'm not going to tell you how you prove this result. It's basically introduction of a bunch of uh, contraction operators, uh, which are special tailored for this problem and, and careful calculations. Uh, it's contraction arguments. Uh, but um, so there is this, this other result, which is more recent with Roshan, which builds on the top of this result that says that eventually uh, you can uh, come up with an algorithm as well uh, that uh, is able to produce an action such that uh, if you keep doing this at all states that you ever encounter, you, you uh, do this planning process uh, at all the states that you encounter, then it's going to be a near optimal action up to this accuracy where kappa is this, this parameter that's an input to the argoton. Epsilon is the approximation error that we had before. You see one over one minus gamma squared here because we had in the previous result one over one minus gamma, even if we solve exactly. But if you um, then follow a policy, then that uh, introduces another one over one minus gamma error. That's probably unavoidable, uh, not quite sure. Um, and, and the query complexity uh, is um, actually independent of the number of dimensions, but depend on the number of core states. And generally, the number of core states is going to be as large as the number of dimensions. So it's like kind of one. Um, and, and, and scales like this. Um, so that's. Um, that's good news. Um, so you can, uh, with this weak assumption, that uh, the optimal action value function lies in the epsilon vicinity uh, of the features that you get. If someone tells you what these core states are, then you can have a, co uh, a low complexity algorithm that uh, gives you um, good actions up to this accuracy. So if epsilon goes to zero, kappa goes to zero, then all fine. Um, in particular, if epsilon is equal to zero, uh, then you know, like you can increase kappa, and then you can uh, achieve any accuracy you wish. Uh, okay. So how does it work? Like how, uh, so what's the proof uh, sketch for this? I'm not sure whether I have time for this, uh, but maybe at a very high level. Uh, so there is this, this blow up that comes from uh, following a policy. And, uh, and so the form of the result that, that we need for this is that uh, if you have an arbitrary policy pi and you're following that policy, then you get some values. And in order to know how suboptimal this policy is, uh, it's enough to know how big the average action gap is where the action gap is measured in terms of these optimal values. So the difference between the best that you could choose uh, at a given state and the, the expected Q star value, optimal action value, under the policy, if you just like one step like that, you use the policy for that step. Was the way if you compare these gaps, uh, then that gives you an upper bound. So it's enough to control this gap. And then the question is, how do you control this gap? And there, the the idea is is to uh, to actually. So it's not shown on this slide, but but the idea is that uh, you uh, you have the core set and you have the LP, and you add uh, the state where you want uh, to extract an extra action distribution to the LP. Okay, so wh what does it mean? Uh, so it means that you're gonna introduce a constraint corresponding to that state, because that state is really important to you. So if it was not included in the core, core set, you would be making indirect inferences about it, and then you would lose something along the way. So rather than doing that, you add to the constraint set this uh, extra constraint, depending on the state. You write the dual of this problem, and then it turns out that the dual can be written somehow 
in this way, and then you solve this dual. When you're solving the dual, you're gonna use a meter proxargetum. A meter proxargetum wants bounded uh, primal space and dual space, and uh, it turns out that you can also do that at the price of uh, some extra um, one over my, one minus gamma factors. Um, in the interest of time, I, I think I, I go on. Um, I don't know whether people have questions uh, to this part. So um, we do have one question, and uh, I believe uh, from Sharan Vaswani. Um, and uh, so the question is what about random? set in every iteration. Um, I believe he's asking if uh, if all the the uh, the features is, is actually lying in a low dimensional space. Does it suffice to actually just sample uh, the core set randomly from different states? I I don't think so. Uh, I. In, in this setting, we kind of already assume that some of the features are low dimensional, so we're not really worried about the high dimensional uh, keys yet. I guess you, that could be an interesting variation. Um, and and uh, we are really bound by this assumption about the core set that uh, all the other features have to be, uh, you can write them as uh, the conic uh, combination of the feature vectors, the core set, and if you just, I mean, like, you could have maybe, uh, maybe you can imagine some nice uh, cases where randomly sampling the states with high probability gives you uh, a, a core set. Uh, it's easy to construct counterexamples when, when that's not the case. So if you care about an algorithm that works always, is not going to work, uh, but uh, maybe it works sometimes. Uh, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so, um, where are we? Um, so, there are a number of things uh, what we wanted. So, so one of the things we wanted is that we want an algorithm which is agnostic to the choice of the MDP. Uh, and yes, we have that. That's great. Like the algorithm doesn't use any information about the MDP. Uh, it just goes on, does its computation. Um, so that's good. It's agnostic. Um, is it computationally efficient? Yes. Uh, the limits is that the core set should be a small core set. So it's not quite solving the original problem, but I think it's getting close. Uh, uh, so it's not really agnostic to the choice of the features because of the core sets. It's the same problem that uh, the, like you have to have a small core set. So the lesson that I have is that uh, we needed this extra structure, and I'm like, you must be wondering about whether this extra structure is really necessary. I don't know. All I can say is that without this extra structure, I, I don't know what to do. Um, so it's a very interesting question. Um, and of course, uh, another interesting question is what happens if you replace linear function approximation with a nonlinear one? Um, at the heart of the computation is, is the computation of a set of point uh, optimization problem. So solving a set of point problem. And, and you can imagine using uh, nonlinear approximators there, maybe things could work, you know, like in some settings, but I really don't know. It's an interesting question. Uh, someone should look at that. All right. So there. Uh, so having said this, this is not very far from uh, being complete answer. Uh, you already see it from the previous slide. Uh, there are ideas out there in the literature which uh, have a big potential. I think so. One of the ideas uh, goes back to Mark Patrick and Shimon Zubatsan. Uh, from 2009 is constraint expansion. Uh, is the idea that uh, so you can, uh, in the transition structure, you can uh, do this multi-step constraint expansion. So it's a little bit different than just like randomly generating or adding constraints or constraint generation. No, it's like it's the MDP idea. And that kind of like 
with that way you can you could there is a potential to nicely interpolate between this look at three type search algorithms and these other algorithms that try to use a global structure based on features. So I am pretty excited about looking into that uh, in the future. So the other is uh, smoothing. Uh, so the, the LP uh, just says that, wow, well, keep the constraints, it's tight. Uh, so you can smoothen that, like you can say that, well, okay, like uh, how about introducing this constraint lags and then maybe penalizing uh, these lags. Uh, so that idea has been explored by others uh, and uh, in generally improves the quality. So it's like all the, these two ideas say that, well, don't think that the LP as written uh, that we started with is the 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 final form and like you, you cannot modify it uh, there are many variations of it and then uh so regarding uh the particle setup point solver that we use meter prox uh it is based on uh assuming that uh the variables uh, the primary dual variables leave in a bounded set and and that causes some blow up of the error in our uh, algorithm or the query complexity blows up as a result of that. Um, so it would be very interesting to work out uh, what, uh, whether you can avoid this boundedness assumption and, and you can still have a computationally efficient set of point solver for this bilinear case. Um, some people in the audience might already know the answer to this. Uh, anyways, um, so I, uh, how am I doing this time? I think you have six minutes remaining. Uh, till okay. the other time. <laughs> All right, so I have two other challenges to present, uh, but um, I guess I have to split it up to two minutes and then one minute for questions. Uh, I don't know that, whether that makes sense. Um, I guess I, I just come to this slide. Uh, so sim to real uh, is, is basically sensitivity problem. Uh, your transition model is not the same as the true transition model. And the question is how do errors propagate? And, and this has been looked at by this uh, gentleman uh, shown on, on, on the slide board with uh, Columbia uh, in, in very early on, 1978, uh, there is this error bound uh, that tells you exactly. And what's really nice about this error bound is that uh, it's not this worst case error bound that you often see in the reinforcement learning, which we just say that, oh, compare the worst case di divergence between uh, the tr two transition kernels. And because that's very harsh, like you can't assume to model the system everywhere uh, up to the same accuracy. Uh, so this, uh, instead of doing that, well, it still has a worst case nature, but it first projects a transition model along a value function, and the value function is the optimal value function that you read out from the model. It's, it's quite, kind of cool. It says that you should take the model, solve for its optimal value function, and whatever errors you see, if you could reduce those errors, choose your model such that this error is reduced and you will be golden. All right, so why am I showing this? Well, because it leads to the third part. So this is a segue to the third part. Uh, so in the third part, uh, I just want to talk about online, uh, the online learning uh, case when you try to minimize regret. Uh, why is nothing on this slide? Yeah, online model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, so this is built on the idea of uh, optimism. And, and I guess lots of people have seen this in some form or another. It's a very general form. You have a model class P, which contains transition models. Uh, that's your prior assumption about the word. And uh, the optimism principle uh, tells you that uh, you should trim those models uh, which are not consistent with your data and keep the ones which are consistent with your data. Uh, so you're running your online procedure collecting data. And then after that, solve this optimistic planning problem. So the optimistic planning problem goes for the optimal policy for the best model in your model class. So this is just value, this J is just the value. 
like the average uh, reward under this policy in this uh, transition model, we assume that the reward function is given. And then uh, what remains uh, to be asked is like, okay, how do we learn? Like, okay, so model class, it's not our business. Someone else chooses it. How do we choose this? So people very often would just say, let's model all the observations. But based on uh, this result by word what? Or bit, you could say that, well, maybe you just need to control this term. And so what you're gonna do is that you collect data. Based on the data, you come up with a value function. The value function gives rise to this loss. And then you say that like, oh, I want to keep all the models such that this loss is not large. So that results in this, uh, this uh, ergotum, which we call value-targeted um, model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, so you define this loss function uh, based on the data, you keep all the uh, models uh, for which the loss is small enough, um, and it nicely closes the loop. So the value function is going to be uh, the optimistic value function that you computed in the the last iteration of the algorithm, and we studied this in the finite horizon case, and we find it that, interestingly, even though we're not trying to model next observations, like next states, like we're not fitting the model to model next states, uh, you can prove that uh, this has as good as a regret as it usually gets. So, so here we show a result for the general case for LU the dimension, which is based on the work of Dan Russo and Van Monroy. Um, and if you specialize it to linear models, then it gets as good as uh, usually uh, we get. Again, it's the finite horizon case. Um, and uh, so it's, it's kind of curious. Uh, so I, I really don't have time for the proof uh, idea, but the proof idea is, is super simple. You just use optimism algebra and then the good techniques that uh, people have uh, worked out in the past. All right, this actually does work, blah, blah, blah. All right, good. Um, so conclusions, uh, I, uh, time's up. Uh, so I, I just put up the conclusion slides. Uh, I don't know whether uh, that remains any time for questions. I, I like the questions during the talk, thanks for those. And uh, yeah. Um, let's thank uh, Shaba for the great talk. Um, so we do have one quick question, I guess, from Ahmed. Um, so um, there's this paper from ICML 2018 on bilinear policy learning, um, which is tries to learn a policy provided the uh, optimal value and the occupancy measure approximate by linear functions using a saddle point formulation of approximate linear, the approximate linear program that you were uh, referring to. Um, and then he was wondering if you can comment on the differences uh, between the... Uh, yeah, so there, uh, there are some very strong assumptions in that work that we are trying to get rid of. Basically, so uh, so that work uh, was uh, very motivating because it showed a positive result. But the strong assumption is that basically under any policy, the distributions under the policy are comparable to each other. And if you have a large state space, that assumption uh, is not likely to be met. So it restricts uh, somehow the class of MDPs in a way that we avoid. Great, thank you. Um, any other quick questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Shaba again for the very uh, inspiring talk. Thank you. All right. Um, I feel cheated. This talk was advertised as being an hour and a half. And it was not an hour and a half? Oh, it was? Did I, I come out that late? Oh, no. Okay, sorry. 
I think I uh, maybe uh, uh, except that like five minutes was uh, yeah like yes yeah. yeah sorry about that <laughs> so thank you Shaba this was uh, very interesting sorry I was late yeah you're welcome my pleasure. Uh, I, I'm happy to stay, by the way. Oh, hi, Nisha. Well, thank you, Chava. It's, it's a nice background for walking the Paris street. Uh, I see. Uh, doing exercise. Michelle, you're not wearing a mask. Well, yes, because like nobody is doing it here. You know, like people like look at you weirdly. This is, we're done. Oh. You are done with this, like you're strong. Like, not you... me, not me. Like everybody, look at the restaurants, bars, everything. Parks are full. It's uh this is it. Yeah. So yeah, so I just wanted to say that like if you guys have questions or whatnot, comments and I'm happy to stay somewhere. Hi, so, sorry, I do have a question. So, how was the museum connected to the uh, to the paper that you presented at the very end about the eluder dimension? Uh, you it's went so fast that it was very hard to get the link. Uh, yeah. So, museum is actually optimizing the same objective. Uh, it doesn't introduce. It doesn't add optimism, and it uses deterministic models. But uh, completely independently of that, uh, they just that let's minimize this objective and and that's uh i find it uh very curious actually Is and you think curious? actually it's uh, like close to the dimension like the other dimension of ben and dan stuff so no like that's that's our word right like um so actually ben and ian had a paper that the appendix almost does this, but not quite. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, right. So, so if you add optimism uh, and this optimistic planning, then you can uh, run the machine, and then then you get uh, based on this area dimension based analysis. I'm like, I'm not telling you details about what is the function space whose alluder dimension you're talking about, right? Okay, 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 I see. The cleverness is constructing that function space, but it's, it's, it's what you would, uh, I mean, like if you sit down, you try to do it, you will, you will be able to do it, I think. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think I'm just gonna sign off. Um, I'm gonna send you the link to the video once it's up. And uh, yeah, thanks again for the great talk. Okay, yeah, thank you guys. I guess I sign off too. Have a good walk, Misha. Thank you, thank you. I need this. <laughs> Bye Chaba, see you tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> yeah, maybe.